Rasinder? Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> I will do. Uh, this is a question for uh, Wendy. Uh, Wendy, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that you didn't get a chance to, to finish your uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I think that uh, what, you, what you were trying to develop had a very nice ironic feel about uh, the local place. And, uh, but I don't know how far uh, the irony was expressed. I mean, did it apply to the Japanese? Uh, because I want you to to sort of uh, juxtapose your understanding of this movie by Chang Mo with, of course, his later movies, which are uh, I mean, you could say they're about local place uh, or uh, about place, but uh, they're about state power and world domination. And uh, I'm thinking particularly about Hero, and it's a very nationalist statement. So, so how? Uh, do you want to talk about that? So both about this movie and the video. Okay, well, this, this movie, like I said, it's a gentler movie, um, and it gets, uh, I think, ultimately, over the course of his career, Johnny Mo started out as an innocent, um, believing that he could kind of go out and perform Chinese culture. He could, he could perform it, not meaning him perform it, but his movies could go out, and they would have some place-based characteristics, and they would be accepted in the world. I, I think that was shut down very, very quickly, mainly after Red Sorghum. And after that, he, he increasingly uh, grew cynical about the possibility of performing Chinese culture. And um, this movie, the, the film's focused on different aspects of this performance of culture. Um, and I think he has a very brutal, um, mostly a very brutal understanding of the market and the mechanics of how culture can be performed across borders. Um, this film, it, because it it's kind of it is kind of a funny film. I mean, there's a lot of humor in it, and, and it's also kind of an ironic film. Um, but I think that where he ends up in this film is showing how there's many logistical problems to crossing borders in, in cultural exchange or in cultural performance. And those logistical problems are actually essential problems. So in order to understand um, the performance of a culture, you have to have spent a lot of time in a place and really know what's going on. You have to deeply know the language. You have to understand the power relations among people. You have to understand position, et cetera, all of these different things. Um, and when Takata goes to China, he doesn't have any of these skills, and therefore he falls into a number of traps. Um, however, he also puts it forward as an essential type of cultural performance. In other words, it's not just crossing borders. There's problems wherever you go. If you get to Hero, Hero is really a meditation on the, the um, possibility of culture being able to stand up to the state. Um, so the assassins, with all of their beautiful poetic lives, their um, amazing colorful clothes, their interest in poetry, dance, and calligraphy, these really represent a cultural world. They also have a very strong uh, yearning for their homeland. They come from the different kinds, the different kingdoms around. Whereas the King of Qin is represented as a monolith with uh, uh, a huge army, all look identical, uh, the same in black outfits. There's no color, there is no poetry, there's no dance, and so that represents a kind of state power. So what Zhang Yimou does in Hero is to put these two worlds up against each other and see what happens. Um, and basically, culture cannot really stand up to the state. So um, his, his brutal understanding of culture is that um, you had better first have economic and political and military power, and then you can have culture. So it's really kind of the story of imperialism in a way. Um, and I, I think it is a, it's quite a cynical vision and it doesn't put him in a good position to go forward as a filmmaker. Because once you get to that position, I'm not sure exactly what you do. We had several hands raised earlier. One, two, and then three. Four. Yes. Uh, my name is Shiroshi. And uh, everyone at Elements and I'll have a PhD dissertation written soon, hopefully before my scholarship runs out. So that's what I do. Uh, my question is for Dr. Amitabh Ghosh. And uh, I've been just like, uh, whatever I've listened, and hopefully I've comp 
comprehended from the papers. Uh, there seems to be this underlying anxiety about uh, art being consumeristic and creative and spontaneous. So we seem to be kind of invested in the dialectic still, but as a as a writer who writes books, who book, whose books are in bookstores, who actively engages in book reading, uh, does quote-unquote promotion, uh, how do you straddle this world of creative, spontaneous versus consumerist, uh, promotional, whatever you call it? That's what I would like to know from you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, one of the ways in which uh, uh, the economic life of a writer differs from the economic life of an artist is that the artist makes uh, uh, unreproducible objects which they sell for very, very high sums of money. Uh, the writer makes reproducible objects uh, which they uh, you know, sell for very little money. And uh, the reality is that the model, the economic model of the artist <laughs> is far, far stronger than the economic model of the writer. Uh, I mean, every art, I mean, you know, some of the artists I know, I mean, they make uh, fabulous uh, sums of money, which is never the case with writers. But I think what writers do have is exactly this, that, the, uh, you know, an artist, uh, this, this one thing that he makes, one painting or sculpture that he or she makes, sold for enormous sums of money, but basically it's sold to one person. Whereas we, uh, our books uh, go out to a lot of people. And in a sense, you know, that is the pleasure of it, that is the sort of excitement of it, you know, that we can come into a circumstance like this and meet people who read our, read our books, who, who feel they know us. Whereas the artist only really has that interaction with a group of connoisseurs, you know, and the connoisseurship really closes their circle. So there is something, you know, uh, there is something that allows us in our, in our world to reach out to people and to listen to listen to people and to hear back from them, and to me this is one of the great privileges of what I do. And uh, you know, um, it's really not about uh, you know uh, uh, promotion as such. I mean, though you know I do that when I need to, because you need to support your publishers and so on. But uh, you know, it's part of the uh, real interest of uh, you know uh, my life. I would say. And then one here. So we take yeah, the lady at back. I'm sorry, I'm not able to identify the names. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kunul Kripalani, uh, a researcher and writer. And my question is uh, to Wendy Larson about Danny Moore. Um, I'm very interested in you finishing the, the unfinished part of your paper because you mentioned that the villagers actually sued him. Mm -hmm. And um, since Jack. Would you say that Yanni Moore is co-opted by the state or not? Because apart from the films, it seems that he has been doing a lot of uh, heritage type of work, I would imagine, with villagers. So do they like him or they don't like him is actually my question. Thank you. Well, well the last bit came about because um, there, there's actually two parts of the paper I didn't get to. One is the, the story. Um, Traveling alone for, or riding alone for thousands of miles comes from the Three Kingdoms story. And it's a very foundational story in Chinese culture about loyalty and emotional depth uh, between uh, sort of sworn brothers. Um, but scholars have actually um, investigated this and found that it's, it, it's really not based on fact. It's one of the most uh, made up parts of the Three Kingdoms. So that adds a, another kind of weird aspect to, to basing uh, this whole mission on something that's really made up and yet has become a foundational Chinese essence type of text. And then the second part is about the lawsuit. And the lawsuit, you know, they, they really loved John Nemo down there. Um, and what happened is that um, his music director decided at the last minute that he would change from um, Yunnan, a, a kind of Yunnan opera, to a, a different opera that's uh, in Anshun in, in uh, Guizhou. And so, what he did is that the guy you see there, uh, Li Jiamian, 
he's actually not the guy performing the dances. And, and in fact, he's a, he is an actor, a, a, a opera performer from Yunna. But the guy who's actually behind the mask and, and dancing <coughs> in the film, along with those other prisoners on the stage dancing, those, those guys are all from Anshun. And it's a totally, it, what they're performing is a different kind. So they sued Johnny Mo and said that he, um, violated the uh, intangible culture protection law. And all they wanted from him was an apology. They actually were so thrilled and they're, they're so upset because what happened now is that everyone who goes to Yunnan to see this kind of opera and all the tourists now, and, and actually it's not there. <laughs> it's in Guido. So, so they, they love him. But they lost. They lost the lawsuit, um, and he was not forced to apologize. Question at the back. Okay, hello. Hi, my name is Carmen. I'm from Malaysia. And um, I would just like to ask a question, maybe to open up the discussion about an area that I think has not been discussed so far, and that is to look at an intersection of arts and technology. Now, I teach at a faculty of, uh, it's called Faculty of Creative Industries. And in Malaysia in particular, there's a huge government push in the last maybe five or ten years or so to push uh, technologically driven kind of art, like talking about animation, design, various areas that look at media arts and digital and technology intersecting. Uh, we haven't really discussed this because one thing I find interesting is for my students especially, uh, when you ask them, you know, what, what is the arts? most of them would not think so much about dance or fine arts. Most of them would think mostly through the vehicle of technology. Right? So something that they create through technology as the main medium of tool. Um, and if you look at the example that was mentioned a couple of times just now uh, about size Gangnam Style, the reason why Gangnam Style was so big is because it went viral on the internet. This would not have happened if we didn't have internet. And also why it was so popular is because a lot of young people redid Gangnam Style their way. Right? So the, to me, the interesting thing about technology, a lot of people talk about Asia as the forefront of technology of the future. And we never really talk about technology at all in to the whole of today's around table. So I'm just interested to know, do, do you see technology as a good or bad thing? Because to me, you need a lot of capital investment in technology, but you also have a lot of young people who are increasingly savvy about that reality. Uh, but they also understand that they may, they may wish to be co-opted into their industry, but at the same time they also like to be creative and they also like to use the thing uh, that would enable them to be creative to a very large audience, which is through technology. So could there be maybe some uh, address, you know, addressing this issue a little bit? Thanks. Thank you. That's a very timely question. It's like uncorking a bottle. I'm sure every one of our panelists will have something to say. So, uh, we were just waiting for a question like that. <laughs> so, we just go serially because there's no point. Uh, yeah. I mean, I won't speak, but going from this side, we'll go all the way to one minute. Okay, so you're right about the Gotham style that it could, would not have been so popular had we not had the internet and it gone viral. However, not every music video that goes on the internet goes viral. So you have to ask the question of why did that one go viral and why don't the others go viral? Um, so um, certainly I think, you know, technology is, is changing everything. It's absolutely changing everything. But so, so, you know, when we first had the internet, uh, when it first came out, a lot of people took immediate advantage, right? And those early, those early people um, get some advantage, you know? And so when a technology comes out, but now with everybody out there putting their videos on YouTube and everything else, you still have the problem. And you still, I mean, as a producer, you still need to get your readers, your viewers, your listeners, your whatnot. Um, so I feel like technology, um, the, the kind of hit of the internet that started at the beginning is now, is, it's now becoming part of normal life that everybody can use. Um, I think the opposition between art and technology is a false opposition. Um, so, for instance, if you think about the German word Kunst, K-U-N-S-T, that was actually um, a word that was used to translate the, German, uh, the, the Greek techne. Um, so, of course, Kunst means, uh, you know, what's art artifice, and simply art, art as an artifice in the broader sense as opposed to fine arts. So, if you think about all of this together along a the continuum, then there is no opposition between the fine arts and um, technology. Um, somehow, I think the question gets uh, conflated with the high culture, low culture um, distinction. 
Um, but then if you think about uh, uh, technology as techne in the broader sense, then um, you know, of course it enlarges um, uh, uh, reception, it um, enlarges the field and of the audience and so on. So obviously I think that it, it's um, very, very important um, in terms of um, discussing the reach um, of uh, art and the arts in Asia. Uh, as I pass the mic, I'll allow myself to the side. I'm very glad that Pinto said this because that's the point, isn't it? In music, the voice is the first instrument. So the idea that technology is separate from art is itself something to <laughs> <laughs> Technology is separate from his <laughs> art. Um, the question about technology was going through my mind earlier when we were discussing uh, exclusion. I mean, I think arguably you could say those who are excluded to that today are those who can't access technology. But the converse of that is the real problem about technology, which has nothing to do with co-optation any more than the, the problem of the commodity is about, is it sort of somehow spiritually good or bad or co-opting, it's about the sheer levels of damaging waste that a technology-dependent culture produces. It's about what happens to the dead technology. It's about the sort of, you know, stinking piles of dead computers around cities like Ningbo in China and, and how all of that goes on. Um, I think in terms of traditional aesthetic questions that we might ask about art, Technology opens up whole fields of creativity for everybody within which some answers to these kinds of problems might come through. And one of the reasons I think Gangnam Style has gone viral is that, that its absolute localness has permitted all of these parodies to be absolutely microscopic in their frame of reference. Uh, some friends of mine yesterday were very excited because there's a Hokkien Gangnam style is called Pa Sang style. And, uh, but the form is comprehensible you know, to millions of people around the world, including some lifeguards in Los Angeles who were arrested for doing it in their swimming pool. So, you know, that's, that's the upside. The downside is about hardware, you know, and, and that's what forums on culture are not always very good at dealing with. Well, uh, technology is nothing new again. You have an 11th century printing, uh, right? Uh, all these images uh, of Buddhist images uh, get transmitted from one place to another because of wood, put, uh, wood block printing. Uh, and uh, there was no Gangnam style at that time, but if you flip through those printed images quickly, it becomes moving pictures, and that's what they created as well because of technology related to printing. Uh, I have nothing to add on this. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the question, in a way, what, I'm, what I hear is the second half of it is that your students are all into this manga and, and animation. Uh, yeah, so maybe there is a kind of divide in terms of uh, how you know one think about creativity in terms of art. And if you are interested, if one were interested in that part of it, of animation and, 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 and manga and, and pop culture, then absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, without internet, a lot of things that we're talking about now would not exist. Uh, give you an, yeah, you know, an interesting thing about, for example, manga, I mean, everybody, who is interested in how, and there's a lot now who produce their own and, and simply upload it on YouTube and maybe get discovered as, uh, and, and you know, most of the time it just quietly disappears. But sometimes it get discovered. But, yeah, you know, I'm interested in the technology part precisely because a lot of the circulation of self-produced things. I mean, self-production of, 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 of this material is possible. And a lot of it is circulated precisely uh, without intervention from, you know, from either the state or capital. 
um, one of the one of the interesting uh, thing is that a lot of the work that is done on the internet in pop culture is really immaterial. I mean, it's really uh, purely for the pleasure of it, and it does escape, but uh, you know, state censorship and uh, capitalist interest. But as you say, they would like to be. They would like to capture the capitalist interest. They would like somebody to take notice and make them very wealthy. They don't escape commodification. Even though it starts out as purely, you know, uh, play or, 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 or entertainment, or actually communal sort of uh, distribution. Um, well, I have two sort of slightly oblique responses. One is that obviously anime, for example, that's taught how that circulates, especially through the internet these days, does actually grab enables certain sort of literary skills to be taught. So when you have certain types of students, stereotypically engineers, that sort of thing, right? And you draw them to a class and it's on Japanese anime. They watch the same thing, this cartoon series or film, film, the iconic films, obviously, things like Akira, of course, in the shell. And they're able to do minute literary analysis on it. Close reading, character studies, better than your lit students because they're really into it. So yes, it's not maybe, it is not, I mean, these are very complex uh, productions in their own right. So it does, there isn't always that separation in terms of the skills that are involved, it's just that certain type of interest, a certain sort of exposure enables a certain type of literary part, literary and cultural analysis that doesn't always occur when they're reading Jane Austen or the much maligned Shakespeare, for instance. <laughs> So that's one thing. The other thing is, I, don't know, I do think that we don't need to make that sharp distinction between current technology and creativity, partly because just stereotypically, the, when the novel appeared in the late 18th century, that wasn't considered good art, right? So it wasn't until George Eliot or whatever, whoever it was that pushes the novel form in the 19th century that it becomes good art. It was sort of a, a leisure pursuit. So these things change as someone like Raymond Williams has, has, has taught us through his writings over the years. So I think in a place like Singapore, in a society which does a rote learning, when, though, even though Singapore has been committed towards trying to change rote learning, at least nominally since 1997, when you want to change that towards that sort of appreciation, that sort of creativity, when uh, creative media, cult cultural industries right, can, be, can be done, cartoons, then it's a problem. So there's um, an advisory committee of a quite well-known American uh, school here with quite a good program. So they, one of the, they have two degrees in game designer, uh, arts degree and a science degree. So they have a really hard time because they, they, every semester they have this big project in which the students must apply what they've learned into creating something. And the problem that the professionals say is that what happens in Singapore is that people just combine code from different games, so you don't necessarily build it from ground up because you can't control the basics. And so one of the difficulties they have is that the kids are, the poly students as well as the A-level students, are very good at exams, but they can't use the knowledge they know. So for example, when you do linear algebra, there's a line, you can have different things as well on both sides, right? CM, centimeters on one side, inches on the other, and you can create different space moving up both from, from the line. They can't quite they can do the test, but they can't work around it to create. So this is a very, very fundamental problem. It's not because they don't try. These students are very hard working from all accounts. So the, the road system does, in fact, on that purely commercial basis, stop a certain level of participation in a certain type of uh, creativity. But even if you did, of course, I mean, the winners and those stakes are you know, very few, very few winners, very high stakes. You see the providential wisdom of the organizers in allotting so little time to the speakers and so much time for question answers. <laughs> uh, we have two hands who were, which were raised earlier. There are many more. I'll come to you later. Second row first, and then the first row. Uh, thanks, uh, Iti Abraham from NUS. I'll direct the question at Peng, but maybe it's uh, probably bigger than that. Um, and it's got to do with, uh, first to invoke the idea of um, the an Asian century, 
obviously takes us back to the original formulation, which is an American century, which of course was also invented by Henry Luce, the Cell Time magazine, but reflects in a sense nothing more than the dominance of America in 1940, when that term comes about. So question one, I guess, is the question of when we think of a nation century, is it in any way not a reproduction of the American century, but with a different geopolitical force behind it? And I want to, in a sense, bring this question of politics and force and dominance uh, forward, because I think that even as we re re respect the kinds of interconnections that may be taking place between different parts of Asia at a very micro, at a very digital kind of level, which I think one can celebrate without question. The kind of answers that we're looking for to the big question that's on the table, which is, as Amitra Bush points out, the question of sustainability and environment, perhaps can only take place at a scale which is far bigger than higher, larger, non-micro, non-digital, and is going to involve a certain amount of force, by which I mean the great problem with sustainability simply is that everyone's operating as an individual, you need, you need to think as a collective, right? And that collective idea of what is right for the community may not be good for the individual. Familiar story. Where does, I mean, how can something like this happen if it's not imposed? So the question to me for this Asian century looking forward is one that it's a spatial idea, not a temporal idea. And secondly, that it involves a kind of a theory of politics where force and domination is actually embedded very deeply in it. Um, so I, there are two questions. Uh, first of all, whether um, the, dom the, the, the phrase, the location in Asian century uh, presupposes the dominance of Asia. So yes, I, mean, I, I, I would say um, that um, it, it, it cannot but be um, a repetition of phrases like the American century, or I mean, what I said in my paper was that it repeats Hegel. It cannot help but repeat Hegel. Even if you are saying, um, no, we, 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 we think it is not. We are denegating it, and therefore we are repeating it in a certain way. I mean, we might wish it to be more benign, we might wish it to be more benevolent, um, but um, you know, the, the part of my paper that I did not read out um, said that the symptom of the one of the, the in, indices of the Asian century is, of course, um, the rise of China, which Pasenjit did mention. Um, but also, if you're looking at, say, news reports about, um, you know, the, 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 the fiscal crisis, um, uh, both of the euro dollar crisis, but also the fiscal cliff. I mean, the sense is that these people can't get their act together, right? Um, so that yes, the, 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 the suggestion is that uh, dominance has shifted. It's a primarily an economic dominance. Stuff, right, not a political dominance. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, my take on the first question. Um, the second uh, question, um, whether or not it involves um, uh, political force. Um, it, I would say it involves political force at the level of execution um, in order to bring all these things about. Um, but I think that there must be a prior level um, of you know where the will is that will demand these things to happen. Um, sometimes I think um, you know it will only happen a little bit like you know when Marx was talking about the proletarian revolution, and he was saying uh, you know why would it happen, right? It would only happen where um, they realize that in order for them to survive, it has to happen. And so with this you know with climate crises and so on, um, I think you know it has to get to a point where people have to realize and people regardless of geographical location and so on. And here, you know, uh, techno mediation, of course, becomes important in uh, creating this kind of will. But when people realize that it can't go on um, as it is going on, right? Um, so I guess uh, the, the issue is, I mean, so, uh, so it's really when we realize that globalization really makes us worldless, right? And then we realize that in order to, uh, uh, for this to be sustainable, um, we have to do something. But did Marxists think and realize? Sorry? Did, did people realize, did the workers realize what Marx? Well, Marx thought they realized it, but you know what they actually realized so was, a different, was a different story. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, you have the, the Franz Fanon um, uh, uh, version of this is why is it that people will revolt? 
right? And they'll revolt when they realize that in order to survive, they have to revolt. First row, yes. I'm Krishna. I'm from. I'm Krishna. I'm from Ari. I noticed that Amitabh Ghosh dubbed the technology question, so I'm going to present it individually to him. <laughs> I read many years ago that you actually wrote your novels, all your writing actually in longhand, and that you didn't compose on 